to me, an interesting parallel is the, the rate of Nanking, uh, which you, you might have heard of by the, the Japanese during the right before the Second World War in 1937, where you also had, uh, even on a bigger scale, uh, because I think it's 300 to 400,000 uh, civilians were murdered in the most atrocious ways on women raped and so on by, uh, by Japanese. But what's interesting is that the Japanese were trying to hide that. Uh, it was Japanese soldiers on the ground doing all of this. Uh, but the Japanese were trying to hide that from their own population, uh, mm. which uh, um, the, the, when you read the book, uh, I've read a book about it, uh, you could see they were like staging, uh, uh, you know, uh, the foreign press or the Japanese press coming to 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 Nanjing in the midst of the massacre on you know like staging an area showing them everything is, is well uh, it's just anti-Japanese propaganda that, that that were doing this it's absolutely not true look at these very happy Chinese right there on you know stuff like that uh, so they were trying to hide and here not only is the Israeli government not like proud of what they're doing but you have the the, the, the population, uh, like we're seeing at the crossings uh, uh, into Gaza, uh, you know, joining in on saying, no, we don't want any humanitarian aid to, uh, to those people. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. The collective West is so sure of its superiority, it doesn't seem to notice that it's in a state of decline. It's facing an obvious defeat in Ukraine, but is determined to continue fighting Russia to the last Ukrainian. It insists on antagonizing China in ridiculous ways, with US members of Congress demanding Biden ban TikTok. Meanwhile, they have zero shame about the genocide in Gaza, even as it's making the world hate the US and Israel, creating a kind of battle between the global North and global South, and laying bare the atrocious reality of the so-called rules-based order. Here to discuss this and more is Arnaud Bertrand, a commentator on economics and geopolitics based in Shanghai. But before we jump into it, this is just part of this episode. The full interview is available to Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Arno, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Rania. I'm glad to be back. It's really good to have you back on. And I mean, the last time we spoke, I, I'm, it was probably more than a year ago at this point. Um, we've talked about Ukraine before. We've talked about China before. A lot of the same uh, issues are taking place in the world, but we have this sort of added horrific genocide in Gaza that we're witnessing in the midst of everything else uh, that's going down. So I think a good place to start would be, you know, I saw you share this this piece on um, on uh, Twitter. It was a really good piece. It's uh, by Michael Brenner, the academic. It's called The West's Reckoning. Um, and it's the subtitle is The West Has Set Itself on a Path of Collective Suicide, Both Moral and Economic. Uh, and he goes on and, and makes the point that, you know, that the genocide in Gaza combined with this sort of obvious Western defeat in Ukraine that the West refuses to really concede over um, is contributing to the decline of Western hegemony. So before we get into some of the more detailed topics that we're going to talk about, I'm curious your comments on that, that sort of general theme of of the defeat in Ukraine mixed with the just complete disastrous, horrific genocide in Gaza contributing to this this decline in Western hegemony that I think began even before that. Yeah, so <clears throat> exactly. I think um, actually Ukraine and Gaza are the great revealers of things that were already the case where that started before. So <clears throat> with Ukraine, we can see that the West is actually uh, much weaker militarily and economically than we thought. Uh, militarily, because despite the entire on the wholesale support of the whole of NATO behind Ukraine, uh, Russia is winning. Uh, they sent Ukraine so many weapons that they've depleted their own arsenals, and Russia is winning, uh, which is quite stunning when you think about it. 
And um, economically, it, it shows that they're weak because they unleashed on Russia the most draconian set of sanctions ever unleashed on a, on a single country. Uh, they even went as far as cutting them up from SWIFT, on confiscating all their uh, dollar reserves and so on. Um, despite all this, Russia is growing faster than any other economy in, in Europe, which again is, is incredible. So if that's not a display of, uh, of weakness, I, I don't know what it is. And, and then with Gaza, we can see that uh, their values were just empty talk. Um, that's what they said all along that they were defending, like human rights, international law, and so on. Uh, they actually don't care about when it goes against the, their own interests. And um, if your values are conditional, those values don't exist. Uh, it means you have deeper unstated values on, on principles which the war on Gaza revealed, which are imperialism, the importance of the, the West collectively remaining on top of the food chain, even if it means perpetrating genocide. Uh, to me, the deeper significance of Gaza, of Gaza uh, I've said this a lot on, on Twitter, is that it's fundamentally a fight between the rules-based order and international law. The rules-based order, basically Western supremacy, has been forced to reveal itself in an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented way as running in opposition to international law, against humanitarian law, against the UN, against UNRWA, ready to defend the killing of journalists, the killing of humanitarian workers, the mass killing of civilians, and, and, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's masks of time. Um, what's behind the mask is immensely repulsive to the immense majority of the planet. And I might add very repulsive even to many people within Western countries. Yeah, it really is just every day gets worse. It's every day you think you can't be shocked more than you already have been. And then the Israelis, the Americans, they do something even more horrific than what was already taking place. And we've now entered the six months of this horror in Gaza. Um, and, you know, I think something interesting about about what we're witnessing in Gaza on top of just the, the absolute horror and just disturbing to watch Israeli society sort of like descend into this fascistic madness is at the same time, you still till now um, have U.S. the U.S. political class defending every little thing the Israelis do um, every you know, I, you've seen them. I know because I see you tweet about it, these uh, statements from these uh, spokespeople for the State Department or the National Security Council, people like Matt Miller and John Kirby will get up on their podiums and defend or justify, you know, the starvation of children or, you know, crazy genocidal statements by the Israelis or the torture of UN workers or the bombing of entire residential areas. I mean, I could go on and on and on, right? While at the mm -hmm. same time, the U.S., and this is something we've discussed in the past, you and I, the U.S. political leaders have continued to accuse China of carrying out a genocide in Xinjiang, um, which seems even more laughable, like when you look at Gaza versus Xinjiang, if you just yeah. compare this is what a genocide looks like. You know, you can say what you want about maybe some of China's policies at some point in Xinjiang, but it's actually like an economically very viable area of China that lots of people visit for tourism. And the reason I raise that is because you now have this, um, this letter that you had actually shared where U.S. members of Congress are urging Biden, it's a bipartisan push, to get Biden to prohibit American citizens from visiting Xinjiang to prevent what they call genocide tourism. So in the midst of this genocide in Gaza, an actual genocide, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this particular development. Um, you know, it, it's just it just seems so, like the audacity to continue to say genocide's happening in Xinjiang while actually carrying out one in Gaza is just mind-blowing to me. But please, go ahead. No, it's, it is mind-blowing. I mean, with Gaza, we can see, like you said, what an actual genocide looks like in the age of social media, uh, maybe for the first time, I, I think. So despite Israel's technological prowess on its complete subjugation of the, the Palestinians, there is no hiding it. We can see a daily stream of the most atrocious images on, on testimonies, and you also get, of course, which is a big characteristic of, of genocide, extremely dehumanizing rhetoric by the perpetrator to, to justify their actions. So, you know, statements like uh, human animals on, on the likes. Um, 
And you, you can now contrast this with Xinjiang, and it, it becomes immediately obvious just how bullshit, is, excuse my French, the narrative is. Uh, we've not seen one, not a single picture of atrocities coming from Xinjiang. Not one picture of a dead child, woman, or even man. The, the, the only one picture that keeps circulating is of uh, Uyghur men sitting in a prison yard as if that was indicative of genocide. Uh, Xinjiang has prisons like every single place on earth. If that was indicative of, of genocide, the term genocide would be absolutely meaningless. And most importantly, there is no dehumanizing rhetoric from Chinese leaders of, or, or, or Chinese people. In fact, the exact contrary. China responded to the accusations by literally celebrating Uyghur culture. You can just go check the Twitter account of any Chinese ambassador, and you will see an endless content showcasing Xinjiang, celebrating Uyghur culture, and so on. So when you contrast this with the declarations of Israeli officials uh, with regard to Gazans, it is just uh, you know day and night. Uh, and to your point, uh, Xinjiang partly in re reaction to the, the accusations has become China's most popular touristic destination with um, a, a crazy, I think, 265 million tourists visiting last year, uh, which in fact, I think that easily makes it one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world. So China has effectively adopted a policy of come and see with your own eyes if the Americans are lying on it. And anyone around the world can freely go to Xinjiang to check it out. Uh, there are literally zero restrictions. And China has even dropped the, the visa requirements for dozens of countries, like France, for instance. So you likely don't even need a visa to go there. And of course, all those tourists go there with their mobile phones, obviously, uh, which makes the absence of atrocity pictures even more salient. And what does the U.S. do? Ironically enough, uh, those U.S. lawmakers that you were mentioning wrote a letter to, to uh, Blinken uh, urging him to ban Americans from traveling to Xinjiang in order to, I quote, uh, prevent Americans to conceal atrocity crimes. So by going to see what's happening with your own eyes, you conceal what's going on there. Uh, and in order not to conceal, you shouldn't look into it into details. I mean, irony is well and truly dead. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Meanwhile, people actually can't go to Gaza. There's journalists who'd like to go, um, but the Israelis don't let them in. They try to cut off the communications. They, And I think that's what's crucial here is I like, mean, yeah, go ahead. Kill journalists. Yes, they they've journalists. killed yeah. over, I think, oh, they've killed like 150 journalists or something insane like exactly. that. It's crazy. Um, and they're obviously intentionally targeting them. I mean, there's just no comparison in the sense of, and then to be justifying that while still going with this crazy narrative is so insane. You mentioned uh, France a, a few times. And so I, I love, I want to pivot to France real quick. I mean, this is the country of your, your this is where you, you grew up, you're French. Um, so you know the political system there well. No, Let's start with the nobody, French government. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Nobody, nobody is perfect. Yeah, no. <laughs> we forgive you. We forgive you. Um, Thank you. But, you know, when it, when it comes to the issue of Gaza, Arno, where does the French government stand with regard to Israel's genocide in Gaza? I know it, you know, full heartedly supported everything Israel did after October 7th. Then at some point, I think France did start saying, at least rhetorically, they wanted a ceasefire. Um, but I imagine this is, you know, I guess let's start with this. What's French government policy towards Gaza? And then I'd love for you to kind of break down perhaps how this issue is um, is breaking down inside France uh, politically, because any issue that has to do with the Middle East or North Africa, particularly when it comes to like Islam or Islamic groups, uh, tends to have a very polarizing impact uh, in France. Yeah, so, I mean, France historically had a policy of being very close to Arabic countries in its uh, foreign policy since De Gaulle. Um, as a Lebanese yourself, you probably know this all too well. Uh, like, remember how close Chirac was to the Hariri family, for instance. Mm -hmm. He even spent the final, his final years living in a Hariri family apartment in Paris. Uh, it looked corrupt as hell, but that's besides the point. Uh, and France was historically the one Western country 
uh, most ready to defend the Palestinian cause. It's no coincidence that one of the main streets in Ramallah is named after Chirac, and there is a Charles de Gaulle street in Gaza. Uh, but since then, with Sarkozy, Hollande, um, now especially Macron, uh, there has been a divorce between France and the Arab world. Uh, France, as far as its foreign policy is concerned, has largely become aligned behind the US, unfortunately just another henchman of uh, of the empire basically um that's uh that was particularly clear during the, the war on gaza for instance macron has led not one but two national commemorations for the victims of october 7th but nothing for the palestinians and some members of his governments have been like just utterly insane so for instance Aurore Berger, who is the, the French minister for the fight against discriminations, literally announced that she will stop funding all French feminist organizations that do not promote Israel's understanding of October 7th and what happened afterwards. So you had the minister against discriminations openly discriminating, uh, which is kind of insane. Uh, and it comes in a context where, as you said, French society is very polarized with the majority of the population moving to the right, even to the extreme right, towards those who platform openly Islamophobic, uh, you know, rhetoric and policies, people like uh, Le Pen or Eric Zemmour. And of course, you still have a minority on the left with uh, Mélenchon, who has about 20% of the votes, but the center is largely gone. And of course, as we are seeing almost everywhere, uh, when you're an Islamophobe, you tend to align with uh, with Israel. So I think the majority of the French population, um, I don't know, well, maybe not the, the the majority, but uh, very substantial um, percentage of the French population uh, does align with with Israel. And I think that Macron is basically being a politician at its worst, not a statesman signing with the public opinion in order to try to steal votes from the extreme right. But at the same time, it means that he's playing into their hands by effectively legitimizing their, their platform. Well, I mean, in that in that sense, I'm curious if you could talk a bit about because I know this is what's happening uh, in the US a lot. It's happening in Germany to an insane degree. But there is this um, way of, of course, using anti-Semitism as a weapon to really suppress dissent. Um, so I'm curious if that's also playing out in France. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've been seeing it, it the way it has in the US across college campuses, for example. And of course, the way Congress has jumped in to try to essentially shut down criticism of Israel as just being automatically based in like Jew hatred. Yeah, so so I mean the, the the big debate these days in France is uh, with Mélenchon's party, uh, La France Insoumise, which is now the one big party on the left, and they're very staunch defenders of uh, of Gaza against genocide. I mean, most of their of their um, uh, elected officials are daily on Twitter, like uh, defending you know, uh, international law, the, the rights of the Palestinians and so on. And, and those people are absolutely, uh, I mean, accused all the time of, uh, of being anti-Semitic by, uh, you know, many French media, uh, politicians on, on the other side of the, of the politician, uh, of the political spectrum. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it is the one tool that they always use. Uh, if you don't align with the uh, Israeli, uh, uh, politics, you're, you're an anti-Semite, but yeah, of course they aren't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to also move to the issue of Ukraine. Um, because Macron has been getting a lot of attention over the last month for saying something so insane, suggesting something so insane that even other European countries were like, wait, what? Uh, he wanted to send French troops to Ukraine. Um, what's behind? I mean, and also France has kind of flip flopped a bit on the issue of Ukraine. It kind of, you know, it's taken a harder U.S. sort of tone and then it'll sort of walk it back. Um, and then it'll come back to the harsh tone. But this seems pretty extreme, the idea of actually sending French troops. So could you explain 
you know, what's what's behind the idea of sending French troops? Um, and has Macron gone completely mad? I mean, does France really think that it, it, it should be involving itself militarily in that kind of direct way in a confrontation with Russia? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to, uh, to understand what, what was behind it. I mean, one context is the, the, the elections in the EU right now, uh, with Macron's party obviously being a major candidate there. Uh, so I think there is some politicking, him trying to, you know, basically show that he's tough on Russia in order to uh, to get elected because he thinks that will play well with the public. I think there is also some sort of power struggle in within Europe uh, um, in order to... I, I think that they somehow predict uh, that... Trump will get elected and will be relatively isolationist. Uh, I mean, Trump has several times said that uh, you know the U.S. should stop uh, funding NATO and uh, should, should stop protecting Europe and so on and so forth. So there is some sort of uh, power struggle in Europe for if that happens, uh, who's going to you know take the, the the mantle and represent Europe and so on. And, um, and there is a big, uh, um, I think, struggle between France and Germany. They've really positioned themselves on, on both sides here with that, with France uh, very clearly saying they will send troops to uh, NATO troops to, to Ukraine on them shorts publicly, which is uh, very rare to, to see such a public battle between France and, and Germany. Uh, shorts publicly saying, no, basically that that's crazy. We're never going to do that. And, and, and then you have some European countries, particularly like the Baltics and so on, some of the more, you know, uh, extremely hostile to the, the countries most uh, mo more hostile to Russia, siding with France, some siding with Germany and so on. So although it's difficult to see exactly uh, the reasoning there, I suspect that that's part of the equation. But uh, but it's a very, very dangerous game, of course, because um, you, know, you need to think through the consequences there. So if NATO uh, sends troops to Ukraine, maybe then Russia is going to ask countries from each side of the ledger mm -hmm. to send troops as well. Why? Why wouldn't they, right? Uh, that's kind of uh, fair. And then, uh, you know, maybe other fronts are, are going to get opened. And then you have the nuclear question. Uh, there has never been, on, for very good reasons, there has never been a confrontation between the Warsaw Pact at the time of the Soviet Union and NATO directly, because, you know, the risk of nuclear weapons being used is, is, is way too important. And then it means the you know, the death of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a uh, it's, it's, it's very, very dangerous game my coin's playing there. Yeah, and you know, I think when we talk about the war in Ukraine, I think there's a trend that became more apparent during the war in Ukraine, and that was the split we saw between the way the global north was behaving about Ukraine, or as they like to call themselves, the collective west, and then the way the global south was behaving about Ukraine, mostly taking either like a neutral position or in some cases, a very anti-NATO position. When it came to the Global South, you would see this in the vote tallies uh, at the UN, uh, where it would be like this handful of you know, Western countries, all of the European countries, the US, Australia, Japan on one side, um, supporting Ukraine whole, like, you know, full, wholeheartedly. Uh, and then on the other side, the rest of the world, which apparently doesn't really matter, but like Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia. Oh, I mean, you know, of course there's nuances there, but for the most part, we started to kind of see this dividing line. And I think, you know, at least from my vantage point, that line has become more clear when it comes to Gaza. And, you know, we can just look at what South Africa did, right? It took the lead with filing this case against Israel at the International Court of Justice. And then we see other global South countries have filed cases against Israel, you know, like Nicaragua. Um, this, you know, genocide is essentially... Uh, the Europeans and the Americans on one side versus the world, you know, give or take a few countries. So 
I, I think in many ways, Gaza has become this very explicit fight, battle, whatever you want to call it, at least legally and rhetorically speaking, of the global north versus the global south. I'm curious if you would agree with that framing. And if yes, you know, do you see this as a significant um, as something significant and part of this bigger pattern that I mentioned w- that we were already seeing take hold in the midst of the war with Ukraine, as well as the Cold War with China, because we've also seen that same line um, when it comes to America versus China. I, I largely agree with the frame, framing, although it's important to note that some Western countries like uh, Ireland, Belgium or yes. Spain have, have been quite clearly denouncing what Israel is doing on supporting international law. And that conversely, some major global South countries like India have been pretty clearly behind Israel uh, because of the Islamophobia that's at the, uh, unfortunately at the heart of, uh, of Modi's platform. So, like I said before, I prefer to frame it in terms of rules-based order versus international law, because then it also gives the option to some Western countries to come to the side of the light, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, to borrow uh, in the other direction a sentence from Netanyahu, because, you know, he said his side was the side of the light. Uh, And if you say it's global global north versus global south, you know, your global north, your global south, you can't do anything to change your, your geography. It entrenches the divide and gives no room for evolution. Uh, um, what we want, want at the end of the day is no divide, right? We want everyone to be on the side of the light, on the side of international law, on the side of morality. So I think it's important uh, to, 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 to give that room on, on frame things with the right languages in order to move towards uh, not a necessary confrontation between the, even though it's, it's, it's there, I agree, to a large extent between the global south and the global north, but provides you know, room for evolution in the future. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's something I want to play. It's a video I want to play. I think it really encapsulates so much of the insanity that we've been seeing, particularly from the US. Um, And then this is, I'm gonna gonna use this video to segue into what I wanna ask you about, but first let's let's take a look at this. For every 30 minutes that someone watches TikTok, every day they become 17% more anti-Semitic, more pro-Hamas based on doing that. We now know that 50% of adults 18 to 25 think that Hamas was warranted in what they did with Israel. So that was a failed Republican presidential candidate, uh, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, saying, I mean, I still want to know where she got this number from, because I I think she just made it up uh, that if you watch a third every every 30 minutes, it's just so insane and so specific for every 30 minutes that somebody watches TikTok, they become 17% more anti-Semitic. Yeah, I was trying to to do the math in my hand. So how long do you need to watch TikTok to be like 100%? (laughs) (laughs) Right? Ridiculous, yeah. But like, I I also just like, I, I remember watching that and then going and looking up, I'm like, where did she get this number? Because it's so specific, no idea. Um, but regardless, she said it, and it's funny. I mean, it does sound funny and ridiculous, but this is becoming a serious and has been a serious accusation. Of course, this, you know, on top of her just trying to like use, this is her trying to use the genocide in Gaza as a way to bring up the anti-China stuff, right? Because at the end of the day, the war on TikTok, as you have and others have pointed out, is part of this tech war with China, this like yep. social media confrontation with China. And now you have a very real uh, attempt uh, before the House, um, the, the House and Congress to try to ban TikTok. Biden apparently is saying he wants to sign the House ban on TikTok. So I'm curious if, if you could, you know, uh, let me know, let us know, what, what are your thoughts on the idea of banning TikTok? What is that actually uh, about? Because I don't think they really believe that it makes, you know, you 17% more anti-Semitic for every 30 minutes you watch it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the the whole rhetoric around TikTok has been insane from the, the get-go. So um, 
So first of all, the common accusation uh, against TikTok, uh, which, which which is reflected in, in what Nikki Haley uh, says, is that uh, there is some sort of uh, evil plan by China to brainwash uh, Americans via TikTok. Uh, and in order to you know, illustrate this, they said China has their own version of TikTok or Douyin on the content is completely different. <laughs> um, and it's true they have their own version of TikTok and then they, they launched TikTok uh, uniquely for the, um, uh, for the international market. Um, and it's true that uh, Douyin uh, is under a lot of, you know, Chinese legislation that puts, as China does uh, with, with social media, a lot of restrictions on, on content. Like there are plenty of laws, even on the amount of time kids can watch the thing and so on. All in all, those are, you know, a lot of common sense uh, legislation in order to avoid that, uh, you know, kids spend too much time on social media, avoid that they see, uh, you know, harmful content and so on and so forth. Um, but there is absolutely nothing that prevents uh, U.S. legislators from enacting, taking the exact same legislation that uh, China has on Douyin and applying them to, to TikTok. Like they can entirely do that on TikTok would, would uh, comply. They, they've repeatedly said so. Uh, and, you know, they went above and beyond to reassure the U.S., you know, saying, um, Please, legislators, we, we will follow all the legislation that that you want. Uh, store our servers uh, in the US. Uh, we will make our, um, our algorithm transparent to a trusted uh, third party, which is, uh, if I remember correctly, Oracle, uh, so that you know exactly uh, what's in our code at any given moment in, in time. Uh, they gave backdoors to the FBI and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but still, uh, the U.S. wants to, um, well, they are doing this new legislation to, uh, if you look, it's it's not so much an attempt to ban them as it is an attempt to steal the company. No what they're saying is that um, you doing like the um, uh, ByteDance, the mother company in China, needs to sell TikTok. Uh, to, I guess, an American player in order for TikTok to survive in the US. So, so it's basically extortion. It's, it's, uh, it's like the mob boss saying, you're in my neighborhood. Uh, uh, I, I need to own your, um, I don't know, restaurant or whatever in order for you to, to remain there. Otherwise, we, we destroy you. Uh, so I think it's it's not so much concerns about actual content because that could be solved easily. It's more a concern about uh, money, about capital, about controlling, uh, controlling the uh, the capital behind TikTok, uh, so that uh, they keep making money and dominate uh, dominate the tech sector outside China. Yeah, I mean, it's really just. Uh... <laughs> just like a, a playing really unfair while complaining. It's and it all, projecting it all onto China at the same time. Um, and since we're on the subject of China, I'm curious, is this genocide in Gaza a huge topic in China? Do people care, you know, one way or another? I mean, their country isn't really involved. Um, so it's, I, I imagine it's not like in the US, right? Like it's, you know, there's no, there's no one who's gonna go protest the Chinese government's policies uh, on, on, you know, Gaza. But is it in the news? Is it something that people discuss? Because it must be one of those things that, at the very least, that's like, wow, the U.S. is willing to support like this, you know, psychotic behavior in Israel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, China has always been uh, extremely pro-Palestinian uh, ever since Mao. Even at the time, Mao was arming the Palestinians, uh, and mm -hmm. he compared it many times to the Taiwan issue. Is so both as a uh, you know very similar. Um, Today, it's the same thing. China is also very pro-Palestinian on the people as well. Um, they, they see it uh, basically through the, the colonial prison, uh, which is, you know, basically um, uh, Israel as a colonial entity trying to, you know, steal the Palestinians' land and, uh, 
and uh, you know enact uh, ethnic cleansing and, and, and genocide on them. So I, I I think the support on the Israeli side is, is basically non-existent in China, or extremely an extremely small uh, minority. Yeah, I just really quickly want to uh, share this. Uh, I don't know if you saw this. This is from a few months back, but I was just reminded of it because of what you're saying, which is that, yeah, there's a very pro-Palestine sentiment in China. The New York Times uh, back in, I'm sorry, what's the date on this? This is back in October, so not even a month into the genocide yet. And for those who are just wa uh, listening, it, the headline was, as China looks to broker Gaza peace, anti-Semitism surges online. And then it goes on to say, China's state-run media has blamed the United States for the deepening crisis while perpetuating tropes of Jewish control of American politics. And then it takes three people, three bylines in this New York Times piece to go on to basically accuse China of spreading anti-Semitism, essentially because people online were disgusted by Israel's behavior in Gaza. Um, so I'm not even going to go through the piece, but I, I just, I, this just came to mind. I, I, I haven't really seen the, the U.S. media try to do this again, at least not anytime recently. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious your your quick thoughts on on the. You might have remembered this piece, Arno, uh, from back. Yeah, back. I, uh, I remember this piece, and uh, if I remember correctly, it was already uh, a, a way back. Uh, it's it's the usual thing. It was accusing uh, China of uh, anti-Semitism when it was just a critique of uh, Israeli policies, uh, <laughs> which. Yeah, which again has nothing to do with uh, with anti-Semitism. So yeah, it's is 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 basically the uh, the usual stuff. The yeah. But also, what maybe what makes me laugh about this is like, there's always this attempt in the West <clears throat> to try to take this sort of anti-Semitism that has a very um, European history, actually, uh, like yeah. like Nazi anti, not like the historically traditionally the sort of Nazi. Um, style anti-Semitism and then project it onto these countries that have no history of that, like China, for example. No. It's no. just such insane. It's just so insane. But actually, um, uh, China yeah. has a very completely different history. Uh, I'm um, I'm the grandson of a Holocaust Jewish survivor myself, so I got very interested in that. Mm. And. Uh, it's it's uh, not many people know that, but uh, during the Holocaust, uh, the only country in the world that had its port wide open to Jews was China, Shanghai. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 the the complete opposite, right? It's the only country in the world that uh, that was a safe harbor. Uh, for Jews during during the the Holocaust, even the U.S. famously was was rejecting uh, Jewish ref refugees during the 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 Second World War. And um, and, and and funnily, many uh, many Jews grew up in Shanghai during that uh, that time period, and, and then moved to uh, to the U.S. And I think that was the case of uh, one secretary. Of the Treasury, uh, Blumenthal, if, if I remember correctly, who actually spoke fluent uh, Shanghai dialect as a, as a result. Um, so yeah, that's uh, unknown history. That makes it even more outrageous to have an American yeah. that America's paper of record to be making such an outlandish accusation. Uh, you know, because when we do think about, <clears throat> it wasn't just the U.S. that turned uh, Jewish refugees away; it was also the U.K. Uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, um, so yeah, then to have this country that actually treated them well and took them in during a time when they were being persecuted in the so-called civilized world, um, to then go and like take this anti-Semitic brush just because they're not aligning with the genocide uh, is actually quite infuriating. Um, to stay on the topic of China for a moment, um, I think there's some there's something that I'd like to point out, and then I'd like your thoughts on because especially when it comes to the issue of sanctions. This is something you followed particularly closely, especially with regard to um, the sanctions on Russia. But when we talk about the so-called resistance axis in the Middle East, you know, that's led by Iran and then is a collection of these various popular uh, military movements across the region, you know, uh, in Iraq, Lebanon, and obviously in Palestine itself, this kind of resistance, you know, at this scale really wouldn't be possible 
without China as this kind of economic counterweight to the U.S. And, and what I mean by that is that the resistance axis receives funding, obviously, in arms from Iran specifically. This is possible because of China, China's existence as an economic powerhouse that refuses to abide by U.S. sanctions on Iran has allowed the Iranian economy to not just survive, but in many ways thrive, to access goods and capital that it whether otherwise couldn't due to the suffocation of U.S. sanctions. And I think we could say the same for, for Russia's role when it comes to Iran as well in many ways. You know, that's, that's, that's not to say that China and Russia are solely or even directly responsible for these armed resistance movements on the ground across the Middle East, just that in this moment in history, their existence um, and ability to to have relationships, economic relationships that kind of like supersede U.S. sanctions um, have allowed for an effective military resistance, specifically in the Middle East, that attacks imperialist interests, the likes of which this region in particular has never had. So I'm just curious your thoughts on what this means for this kind of emerging multipolar world that we often talk about uh, as we witness this gradual decline in Western hegemony. So I think you're correct that the rise of China and Russia's recovery as a great power. Um, uh, on, 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 by the way, Russia's uh, uh, ability to uh, defeat uh, the sanctions uh, here uh, during the war in Ukraine is also largely thanks to uh, China's power as, as an economy today. Like if, if China was the country that it was uh, 30 years ago, it absolutely wouldn't be possible. Um, so yeah, the rise of China and Russia's recovery as a, as a great power has made the world multipolar. Uh, Unipolarity is well and truly over, uh, but it will actually make the world uh, quite unstable, I'm afraid, uh, until a new equilibrium is found. Um, Looking back at history for uh, teachings about the present, I was reading recently uh, the fantastic book, which you must know, uh, The Jakarta Method uh, by Vincent Bevins, mm. um, about what happened during the, the Cold War, um, which uh, you know for many countries wasn't called at all. Uh, it's called The Jakarta Method because um, during, uh, during the Cold War, uh, there was a very progressive uh, government uh, in Indonesia, uh, led by uh, a guy called Suarto. Um, he had communists in his government, and uh, you know he was very left-leaning. He launched the well under him was launched the the, the Bandung movement, uh, which was famously you know third world countries. Uh, sort of gathering together on trying to promote a more uh, egalitarian world where they would have, you know, equal rights, equal power than uh, than than the first world and, and the second world. Um, and it was not to be, <laughs> unfortunately, because then uh, the U.S. backed uh, the Indonesian military. Uh, who basically did a coup in, in the country. And as soon as they, they got power, they executed all the communists, um, leading to, I think, close to one million killings uh, in, in the country, one million deaths. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the military dictator, Sukarno, uh, stayed in power during the, the following like 30 years uh, um, was one of the most uh, corrupt uh, regimes anywhere on earth. Uh, and it's called the Jakarta method because the same method uh, was then used, uh, you know, uh, sort of inspired by this great example of uh, the US sort of winning over Indonesia. Uh, they started to apply the same formula. In, in many different countries around the world. I think in the book, you found 15 or so examples of a uh, very similar pattern, uh, you know, famously in, in South America, like Chile with uh, with uh, Allende and Pinochet and, and so on and so forth. So to me, the big danger of the present period is this, where um, 
because we have this uh, this competition uh, between poles uh, emerging, uh, uh, one pole <laughs> I suspect is going to be the the US pole uh, will go to extreme length, uh, like even to the length of genocide, as, as we're seeing in Gaza, sadly in order to uh, keep uh, countries, regions uh, on his side of, 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 of the ledger. So we're, we're in for, for a period of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of instability and it will take uh, immense uh, statecraft shift uh, from the other side to try to navigate that uh, and, and, you know, come out, uh, I wouldn't say the winners because we, I, I don't want the, that's the dynamic that shouldn't happen. We don't want one camp to win over another. We want at the end everyone to emerge uh, on uh, on the side of sanity, international law, morality, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, <laughs> yeah, hopefully, let's see. I mean, yes, ideally, we of course want that, but what we're seeing is that. You talk about this like you know rules-based order versus international law i mean it looks as though even when we talk about the rules-based order what does that mean i mean it's what the americans have really created um to use as a weapon against the to, to sort of control the world uh by their rules but they still have this you know at least pretense of certain things that they followed but all of that it, they're allowing all of that to be destroyed with their support for what the Israelis are doing in Gaza. I mean, the Israelis are just like openly committing a genocide. They're killing UN workers, right? And torturing UN workers. They're killing journalists. They're killing entire families. They're starving a population on purpose. And they're saying they're doing it. They're allowing their soldiers to post the most disturbing footage of their crimes because they're proud of them. They are, I mean, we could sit here and do a whole show about what the Israelis have done, but they're essentially destroying the entire so-called rules-based order, or at least all of the fake things that it claimed to represent. So I, my question for you is, why do you think the U.S. and Europeans are willing to ruin this thing that they built all to protect Israel's ability to continue to carry out a genocide? Mm -hmm. I mean, the first question is... Uh... Is Israel destroying the rules-based order or revealing it?